Hi everyone, my name is Wendy, and thank you for joining me for having the conversation, talking about and planning your wishes for future health care. We've all thought about having to create an advanced directive, and many of us already have, but others perhaps not have taken that plunge, and I think it's because it can be very overwhelming, and not knowing where to start makes us not start at all. So the goals of our class today are to help you understand why advanced care planning is important, what it is, what the process of it is, um, so that you can empower yourself to have a conversation about your future healthcare wishes and decisions with your loved ones and your healthcare providers. And then finally, also to learn the steps to create the document of your healthcare wishes and decisions, which is your New Hampshire Advanced Directive. So the main takeaway for today really is that this is a process. Advanced care planning really means planning ahead before a crisis happens. And it's a dynamic process because we're moving through this process sometimes forward, one step at a time, sometimes we might need to go backward, but really understanding that this process has four different parts to it, and the end result is the creation of the advanced directive documents. So many of us think that that's the place to begin, but really where we want to start is to understand why it's important for us to plan ahead, what my choices are, to think about what matters most to me, what are my values, goals, and beliefs, to be asking yourself those questions and how those values, goals, and beliefs shape your health care wishes and decisions. Then having a conversation. That's why that's the main title of this class. It's so important. It's one of the most important things you can do is to talk to people in your life about what your wishes and decisions are for your future health care, including, and most importantly, your end-of-life care. So asking those questions, who do I want to talk to about my wishes and decisions? How do I even have that conversation? And then finally, the documenting piece, creating the advanced directive, which really is the product of all of these advanced care planning steps that you've taken. And it is the legal document of what your wishes and decisions are. Knowing also that this is a dynamic process because it can change over time. Our wishes and decisions for future care, including end-of-life care, can change depending on what our health status is, what our personal goals are, and how those might change over time. So just like we ourselves aren't static in our lives, our wishes and decisions, our values and goals and beliefs, and how they inform each other won't necessarily remain the same. And then when you throw in a situation like a serious chronic illness or even a terminal illness, um, those are going to have a huge impact on what our wishes and decisions are and how we have to adjust our advanced care planning and our advanced directive as well. So understanding why we want to plan ahead. So it certainly makes sense to plan ahead on so many things in life, but when it comes to planning ahead for end-of-life decisions, as I said before, oftentimes it's really hard for us to take that first step. Studies show that most Americans recognize that talking about end-of-life care is important, but most haven't done so. So if you're watching this class because you haven't done so, um, you're not alone. Um, really, when it's time to make end-of-life decisions, about half of us aren't able to speak for ourselves. So we really need to be thinking about planning ahead um, because most of the time we will pass away after experiencing a chronic, progressive, and ultimately fatal illness. And if we're unable to speak for ourselves, whether it be temporary or permanently, um, we won't have a way to communicate the type of care that we want, and our loved ones and our healthcare providers will be left trying to figure that out. Sudden illness or accidents can happen to anyone, and it's important that we think about that context as well as the context of our changing healthcare status so that we let our loved ones know which unburdens them and doesn't leave them to try to figure out what they think we might want when we have the opportunity to let them know what we actually want. And the same with our healthcare providers, knowing that the default in healthcare is to treat no matter the situation. 
And if somebody is at the end of their life and they're not able to speak for themselves and they really don't want aggressive care, how will anyone know? So that's why it's so important to plan ahead. We also want to try to understand what some of our treatment choices are for serious illness or end-of-life care. And it doesn't mean that we have to be thinking about every kind of situation or scenario or every certain kind of treatment, but just to get a general understanding of what our options are and then knowing that we have resources that we can use to help figure that out depending on what our current health status is, what our values and beliefs and goals are, and that our choices on the type of care we receive are really going to be informed by those things. So a lot of people wonder when they look at those documents, when they're handed the New Hampshire Advanced Care Planning Guide, which I'll be showing you, um, they wonder, well, how do I even know what this means? They open up and they look at the documents and they say, how do I know that I don't want life-sustaining treatment given to me or not given to me? What does that even mean? So first of all, we want to understand that life-sustaining treatment simply means that the, these are medical procedures or treatments that would be given to you without which uh, we would die. So if we're in a situation where um, we would pass away under normal circumstances, these medical procedures or treatments are really artificially delaying our death, delaying our passing. These are also looked at in the context of the written judgment of your attending physician or nurse practitioner. So whoever is taking care of you at the time would make a medical decision around that. But it's not made in a vacuum, but it's made through the healthcare team and in the lead of the attending physician or nurse practitioner. So again, life sustaining treatment would only artificially delay the moment of death where a person is near death or is permanently unconscious. So in our advanced care planning guide, there are all kinds of um, definitions and questions and answers that can help you understand what those treatment choices mean. But ultimately, it's really something to consider in the context of what matters most to you and in the context of your current health status. Other treatment choices are palliative care and hospice care. Oftentimes, people use the term comfort care to stand in for palliative care. And palliative care is a team approach to what is a very complex set of physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs that can occur when a person has a serious ongoing illness. So it's not something that just enters into care at the end of life, but is really part of the care team when somebody has a serious illness versus hospice care, which includes medical, nursing, social services, and spiritual care near and at the end of life. So I really like these definitions because they can help people understand what the difference is because palliative and hospice care have a lot of uh, similarities. They all want to provide that physical, emotional, social, and spiritual support of patients and families. But palliative care, once again, is something that anybody can enter into at the beginning of a serious illness and throughout their care, just like they might consult with a cardiologist if they have heart problems or a, uh, an oncologist if they have cancer. That palliative care team is simply part of your care team. And hospice care, once again, is that support team that is taking care of patients who are near and at the end of life and also helping to care for their families. So again, your treatment choices can depend on where you are in your health status, in your lifespan, and having conversations with your physicians about those choices is very important. So when we're trying to understand our treatment choices for serious illness or end-of-life care, there are lots of terms that can be, needless to say, a little intimidating. For example, life-sustaining treatment, what does that mean? So really, we, we want to go to our resources to help us get more comfortable with those terms and have a better understanding of them. So this advanced care planning guide that the New Hampshire Foundation for Healthy Communities puts out has a wealth of information. Most people 
might turn to the middle forms and just see that here are the documents for creating your New Hampshire Advanced Directive, but they don't have a chance to really go through and see all of the information that comes before those documents and then afterwards. So when we're trying to understand, you know, what does life-sustaining treatment mean? What is hospice? What is palliative care? Um, you know, how do I do this? Uh, it really can be so helpful to go through and look at this Q&A piece that lasts in the beginning pages of this document where you're going to learn all different kinds of things in a question and answer format. Um, and then going to the definition pages at the back. So what does life-sustaining treatment mean? And there it is for you right there. Very clearly defined, it even gives examples of what we mean by life-sustaining treatment. So any sort of medical procedure or treatment that would artificially delay a natural death is the general meaning, and then this can really lay it out. So knowing that it also includes medically given nutrition and hydration. So um, nutrition uh, or food, we can say, given by either a feeding tube or an IV, or uh, hydration, water given to us, fluids given to us by um, a feeding tube or an IV is considered to be life-sustaining treatment, for example, along with the things that we think about like ventilators and, and things of that nature. So again, this booklet has a lot of great information for you to refer to to get a better understanding about what some of those treatment choices terms mean. Um, and the tool from the conversation project called How to Talk to Your Doctor also can help with that information. Um, as it gets you ready to have your conversation with your healthcare team, there are also some definitions in this booklet on page five that can help you with confirming your understanding. But I also wanna read to you what it says in the booklet um, because I think this is a really important takeaway. We're not supposed to become uh, medical experts in figuring all this out. So let's listen to what they say, because they say it best. Remember, your job is not to come up with a list of treatment options. That's your care team's job. Your role is to help your doctor or nurse practitioner understand what matters most to you. Then they can explain and discuss treatment options in the context of your current health status and your wishes, then you can make the decision that's right for you. I love that, that really helps to frame it. So getting a general understanding about what the terms mean, but really understanding that your healthcare team is going to guide you depending on where you are in your health status and how you frame for them what your values and goals and beliefs are. The next step in our advanced care planning process is reflection. So really what we mean by that is thinking about what matters most to us. Um, some of the questions on this slide can give you a start. Um, we're really talking about what gives our life meaning? Um, what are our values? What are our beliefs? Um, what kind of health care would we want and not want at the end of life given what our beliefs are, um, what our goals are, what we mean by quality of life. Quality of life means different things to different people. And the most important thing to realize is that there's no right or wrong answer. It's really about what matters most to each of us individually. The last question on this slide, I think, is a really great question, which comes directly from the Conversation Project starter kit that I'll be showing you, that it really is what are the three most important things you would want your family and friends or doctors to understand about your wishes for end-of-life care? It can really be boiled down to that. So this is the way that you kind of get yourself started in your thought process of where am I in my life now? What do I mean by quality of life? And how does that translate into the kind of care that I would or perhaps would not want to receive at the end of my life? And then finally, the conversation, which is so important. As I said, it's really the most important thing that you can do in this process before creating your actual advanced directive. And it's really about creating that plan and answering those essential questions. Who, when, where, what, and how? Who do you want to talk to? When would be a good time to talk? Where would you feel comfortable talking? 
What do you say? How do you say it? These are all questions that at first can feel difficult to answer, but with some of the tools that we'll be talking about, it will be a little bit easier and kind of help to give you a frame of reference. But where we're going with this is having that conversation being paramount, to have that opportunity to not only talk about what you've been thinking through for yourself, which is really important for each of us, but it's equally important for our loved ones so that we're having that honest discussion, that we're reflecting with our loved ones, and we are making these plans before a crisis happens, before we're in a situation where we may be temporarily unable to speak for ourselves, um, for ha perhaps we're unconscious after a motor vehicle accident, or if we're permanently unable to speak for ourselves, whether it's because we're near death or permanently unconscious for a different reason, or perhaps we're even um, in a situation of advanced Alzheimer's or dementia where we are unable to truly express our values and beliefs and decisions. These conversations, although are, they're difficult, there's no question, um, they're also very comforting. They can provide comfort to our loved ones when they know what our wishes and decisions are. And again, it's that idea of unburdening them. It's a burden on our loved ones and on our healthcare providers for them to try to figure out what we want if we're not able to tell them if they don't know. Sometimes people know us really well and we might think, oh yeah, th they know what I would want at the end of my life. But if there's any question about it, it can create a lot of discomfort and can also create for some difficult family dynamics. So knowing that we've involved everyone in our lives that we want to involve in these conversations to know where we're coming from is gonna give us comfort as well as them. Thinking about what matters most to us when we think about reflection and answering those questions, again, the tools are here for us to use. So page, the beginning page of the advanced care planning document frames those same sorts of questions here for you to give you some ideas of the kinds of questions you wanna ask yourself. The conversation starter kit from the Conversation Project, which is a nonprofit organization that is designed to help people have these conversations and feel empowered to have these conversations, provides excellent tools in this regard. So it really goes into um, some of these questions and answers. This is where we got the um, thinking about when will you be ready to have your conversation, what matters most to you, um, weighing your values and beliefs on these scales to help you frame, okay, based on how I feel and my values and goals and what I think is important, what I think is quality of life, how does that translate into the kind of care I would like to receive? So we don't have to think of it all on our own. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's what these tools are for, whether we're getting ready to have a conversation with loved ones which the conversation project recommends that you do first, and then going on to have that conversation with your healthcare team. These tools are here to help you think about what matters most to you and then create your conversation plan. So when we think about that next step of creating the conversation plan in the starter kit, it literally helps you frame that who, when, where, what, and how that we want to have when we have this conversation. It literally has a checkbox where you can decide who you want to include, where you would feel comfortable, what do you want to make sure you say. Um, so again, it's a, it's a nice framework. It even gives you icebreakers, little things that you can say to get started. Because sometimes we just don't know where to get started. And when that happens, then we don't start. So that's what these tools are for, to empower us to feel confident and comfortable to have the conversations that are extremely important in our care.